Today we're going to start our study of consumer choice, and this theory of consumer choice is going to help us to derive demand curves. So ultimately it will take a few sections to get there, but our ultimate goal is to have a theory that generates demand curves for us, and in the process we'll develop a deeper understanding of the demand curves. So there's going to be two ingredients in our theory of consumer choice. First, we're going to talk about preferences. The consumer has to have preferences between the different goods he can buy. Say, in this unit we're working on soda and pizza. He's going to have to have preferences between how much soda he, about how much soda he wants to drink and how much pizza he wants to eat and the trade-off between the two. Second, he's going to have to have restricted possibilities. If he could buy as much pizza and as much soda as he wanted, then there's really no point in having to develop a theory of consumer choice. His choice is whatever he wants. Uh, in, our, in our model, the choices are going to be restricted by his income, so if he only has $10, he can only buy so much pizza and so much soda before he runs out of money. So in summary, the two questions we're going to ask today is, what does he prefer? Can we rank his preferences? And then second, what is it actually possible for him to consume? So we can do a simple numerical example. Uh, our consumer, we'll call him Steve, has $6, and he has some options listed below in the table about how many slices of pizza he can buy and how many cans of soda. He could buy one slice of pizza and one can of soda, and that'll cost him $4. And then this last column, utility. Utilities are buzzword for preferences. The higher the utility, the more he prefers that option. So you can see how the utility is higher. It's six if he gets two cans of soda and two slices of pizza than if he gets one of each when his utility is only three. Sometimes people will tell you utility means happiness. That's a traditional philosopher use of the term, but it's not how economists think of it. In our models, the consumer will always pick to maximize his utility. But we know in real life that consumers pick lot, make lots of choices that are stupid and make them miserable. For instance, you might eat too many cookies and feel sick, or you might decide to buy a house near a highway that's really loud, and you think you'll be happy because it's big, but it actually makes you miserable because of the noise. So there's four options here. First, we have to think about what Steve's actual possibilities are. He could buy one of each, or two slices in a soda, or one slice and two sodas. All of these cost less than or equal to the $6 he has. But if he tried to buy two of each, it's going to cost him $7, as I, as I made a box around, and he's not going to be able to pay for that because he only has $6. So we can rule out the last row, and he's left with three choices. Among the possibilities now, now that we've ruled out infeasible possibilities, we just have to ask what he prefers. In this case, he clearly prefers getting five utility to three or four by definition, so he's going to pick to eat one slice and buy two sodas. And this will help to generate our demand curve, because now we have a point of how much pizza he wants to buy, given his income and a price. So the problem with the approach on the previous slide, even though it's relatively simple, is that there's going to be way too many options to consider for our consumer in our models. He, it's, there's not just an option of one slice and one soda. He could buy a slice and a half. He could buy a slice every other day. He could buy 50 slices, 30 slices, 10 slices, and the table's going to be way too big for this to be a tractable approach. So that means, unfortunately, that numerical methods and our tables are out, and the entire unit will focus on graphs and equations, the graphical approach and the analytical. Most of 1010A, the intermediate micro class, focuses on equations, and since most of the interesting work we'll do in this unit requires calculus, as a result, most of the emphasis will be on graphs. So the first tool we need to develop when analyzing graphs is called indifference curves. An indifference curve is a group of all the points where the utility is the same. So for instance, if I'm indifferent between getting two slices of uh, two cups of soda and one slice of pizza, this point here in the upper left, or getting two slices of pizza and one soda, this point here, then they would both be on the same indifference curve. So we can draw in connecting all these different points 
that I'm indifferent between. And indifference curves will tend to have a, b a bent shape like I've drawn in instead of being straight lines. We'll get to why that is later. But we can see that Steve would probably clearly prefer two of each to having one and two or two and one as far as slices, and pizza, uh, slices of pizza and cans of soda go. So we can do another indifference curve that connects this point to two to all the points he's indifferent between. This is a higher indifference curve that represents higher utility. So if Steve has to choose between which curve he wants to be on, he'll pick the one that's further out. Finally, we know there will be indif an indifference curve that ha has this point, 1, 1 on it, and it's further down and below the other two curves because Steve's less happy, or he gets less utility, to be more precise, when he only gets one of each. So there's a typo on this slide. Why do they bow out? On the last slide, I, know, I said that we prefer to draw curves that have a bent shape, not straight lines. The idea is that people prefer variety. So if you have a choice between two slices of pizza and no soda, or no soda and two slices of pizza, sorry, and two sodas and no pizza, or one of each, you'll probably pick one of each. So the graph will have this point, 2, 1, and this point, uh, 0, 2, and this point, 1, 1, will not all be connected by a line. Instead, this one will be on a higher curve, and these two will be on a lower curve. The second is, why is the one that's further out better than the ones that are further in? So as we move up and to the right, uh, our utility increases. The idea is that more is better than less, and they attribute that great insight into human reasoning to those AT&T commercials where they have little kids say, more is better than less. So next we're going to study the budget constraint. Our indifference curves uh, show us information about our preferences, what we'll prefer to buy. Our budget constraint now is going to show us what it's possible to buy. So it'll eliminate all the infeasible points and we'll be left with the points that are feasible to purchase. And our starting point is by asking about the price of our two goods we're consuming. Uh, the pizza, we'll say, costs $2 a slice, and the soda costs $2 a can, and we'll say our income is 10 Since we can only spend up to that $10, 2 times the number of slices of our pizza, that's how much we spend on pizza, plus 2 times the number of cans of soda we drink, that's how much we spend on soda, has to be less than 10 our total income, the total amount we can spend. So we get this relationship that'll constrain how much we can buy. To make this useful on the graph, we'll need to rearrange and put only the S on the left and all the other variables on the right so we can graph it. When we do that, we get S equals 10 divided by 2 minus 2P divided by 2. You can simplify, and we'll bring that up on the side. S equals 5 minus P is the simplified equation. Now, we, this equation is our budget constraint. So we can use it to, to draw in a graph, that a line that will separate all that we can buy, the, the feasible possibilities, from the ease, infeasible possibilities. So our vertical intercept, if we plug in 0 for P, is 5. So we know this point is on our budget constraint. If S is 0, then we know P must be 5. So we know this point is on our budget constraint. And the budget constraint is linear, so it's a straight line that connects these two points. We can see the slope is 1. There's a 1 implicit right here. So our budget and our budget constraint in general will just be a straight line. These points that I'm coloring in in blue are feasible, although as you can imagine we wouldn't want to pick a point close to the origin when we could pick a point out here or here that's on the budget constraint, spending all of our money. And then these points that are left in the white space up and to the right are infeasible. We just can't afford to, to buy those consumption bundles. So now we have three review questions. The first is, what are the two questions that we have to answer in finding out uh, how the consumer behaves? That goes back to the, I know the wording might be a little unclear, but that goes back to the first slide. We developed two concepts, indifference curves and budget constraint. What are they used for? Second. Why do indifference curves bow out? You know, why aren't they a straight line? What assumption will make that true? And then the third is, 
What happens to the budget constraint graphically if income increases? You can use an example or your intuition, but draw a graph that shows how the uh, budget constraint will shift if income increases.